Up until the late 80s, I had worked on mercury strictly as a phenomenon of bacterial resistance. And it was a nice model system. You could do all kinds of physiology and biochemistry, and it was um, fun to do and easy to work on. And we had uh, lots of interest uh, from NIH and NSF uh, in supporting. And I, I remember very distinctly, it was a winter afternoon uh, in December, I think, that I happened to uh, flip open a, a copy of the FACEP journal, which is a general um, life sciences, medically oriented journal. And I saw this paper which had a picture of a sheep with radio autography uh, a demonstration of all the mercury that was in this sheep. And I thought, wow, that's really strange. <laughs> and it was their very first paper, which was published in the FACEP J. Uh, and showed that um, when you put fillings into uh, an animal, uh, that the mercury goes everywhere. In some places more than others, as has been pointed out in the jaw and the, and the kidney and so forth, and particularly in the GI tract, in the gut, in other words. And uh, so I picked up the phone at that point and I called Fritz Lorscheider and I said I'd found his study very interesting and that I'd worked on mercury and bacteria and I asked him if he knew anything about mercury resistant bacteria. And he said he'd never heard of such a thing. So we had a conversation that ended up in establishing a plan to go forward to collaborate with him because they'd already begun to work on the monkeys. Uh, they did all of the um, housing of the animals and the feeding of the animals and so forth up in Calgary. And um, they um, put the fillings in in a regular uh, dental operatory and so forth that they had there. So. Um, and then they sent us the samples of monkey feces, freshly collected each day, or actually twice a week. We then immediately did bacteriological work on them that allowed us to see the two things that we were particularly interested in were how many uh, of the uh, microorganisms that we were cultivating. And we, we cultivated three, uh, no, three different types of, of bacteria uh, from um, the uh, monkey feces. And we had a way to figure out how many of them were mercury resistant and uh, what proportion were mercury resistant of the total and what proportion also carried antibiotic resistance genes. And the reason we were interested in asking that question was because we already knew, the whole world knew, that the genes for mercury resistance, uh, well I should say the whole world of microbi, well I should actually say the, the small world of people interested in antibiotic resistance in bacteria knew that um, the genes for mercury resistance were carried on bacterial plasmids, uh, which also carried antibiotic resistance genes. And now bacterial plasmids are little supernumerary chromosomes that bacteria can kind of exchange with each other, like sort of like little apps that you can exchange with your friends that allow you to be resistant to things. And so um, the uh, mercury resistance genes, being on the same plasmids as antibiotic resistance genes, if you expose a bacterial community to antibiotics, of course, that will per cause the bacteria to persist as antibiotic resistance bacteria. And people were concerned about that already because they knew that overuse of antibiotics was causing a prevalence and spread of antibiotic multi-resistance in humans, which is a problem. And we were interested in this experiment to see whether or not exposure of animals with their microorganisms to mercury, uh, resulting in the exposure of the microbes themselves to mercury, would um, cause a persistence and prevalence not only of the mercury resistance, but also of the antibiotic resistance because of genetic linkage. If you pick the mercury resistance, you can carry along the antibiotic resistance as well. So those, that was the purpose of those experiments. And that paper was published in Antimicrobial Agents and Chemotherapy in April of 93. And it made the case that exposure of these primates, which are a reasonably good model for human biology and microbiology, uh, to mercury uh, resulted in their a proliferation of microbes in their gut that had um, both mercury resistance and multiple antibiotic resistances. And that in the early monkeys that we worked with them on, um, the fillings were taken out after two months. And so we could see a decline in mercury resistant bacteria and antibiotic multi resistant bacteria after that period. So that clearly associated them with uh, the exposure to mercury in, of the microbiota of the animals that we were looking at. 
and the animals didn't have any exposure to any other uh, mercury. And in a couple of the cases, they were working with radioactive mercury, so it wasn't an issue of, you know, getting the mercury from their diet or anything like that. Uh, but they also were not, of course, eating fish. And uh, the, the, we arranged with them ahead of time that the monkeys were, t the, the kind of animal chow that they had, had no antibiotics in it. Because there are some laboratory chows which are um, um, amended with antibiotics uh, so that the animals will not come down with something while they're doing an experiment on something else. So we have data on uh, the development of mercury and multiple antibiotic resistance in the normal flora, and that included both the oral flora as well as the GI tract flora in these animals uh, that had amalgam fillings, and the only source of mercury was from the amalgam fillings. And so in all those cases, um, there was a proliferation of antibiotic multi-resistance along with mercury resistance uh, as subsequent to the installation of the fillings. And that was statistically significant. We, had, we did statistics on those data and it was a statistically significant difference uh, after the installation of the amalgams for both the mercury resistance and the antibiotic resistance.